Our world needs to see God. Desperately. Whether they know it or not. Our world needs to see God. They need to see his protection and his love and his comforting hand. Our world needs to see God. needs to see God. And what if moms are giving the world a glimpse? What if the world can see God uniquely through moms? What if there's nothing ordinary about being a mom? It's easy for moms to miss the real effect they have in the world. When they protect, they're displaying a God who protects. When they comfort, moms display a God who comforts. As they love and listen and support and carry and hold and counsel and play and work and feed and dance and teach. As they do these things, moms do so much more than they realize. They are showing the world a portrait. Of God. Our world indeed does need to see God. And perhaps there's no other greater reflection of God and His character that is more vivid and more pronounced than in the lives of a mother, and particularly the one aspect of God's character that uh, mothers exude uh, vibrantly and faithfully for us is the, is the character of hope. And thus the title for this morning is Motherhood Embodies Hope. Motherhood Embodies Hope. The whole of Scripture depicts motherhood as the, embody, as the embodiment of hope in at least three particular ways. Number one, they embody hope in pain and suffering. Number two, they embody hope with joy despite of sorrow. And number three, they embody hope with perseverance and anticipation. Let us consider the first way moms embody hope, that is, they embody hope in pain and suffering, which the prophet Isaiah illustrates for us in the 26th chapter. Verse 17, follow along silently. As a pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she writhes and cries out in her labor pains. I'm sure as mothers here can recall the, the birthing of their children as they read this. Dads cannot relate to this passage, only moms can. Thus, were we before thee, O Lord? Verse 18, we were pregnant. We writhed in labor. We gave birth, as it were, only to win. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor inhabitants of the world born. Here, Isaiah expresses the pain and the disappointment of Judah, primarily against God. Judah is disappointed at God because God allowed Babylon, a foreign nation and a more evil nation, to discipline them. And God's discipline through Babylon rendered them helpless and powerless to save themselves, much like a pregnant mother who goes into labor and is helpless and powerless to deliver a healthy child, but only to the wind, only to have a miscarriage at the very end. So possibly Isaiah here is referring to the pain of a miscarriage for the mother who endures the pain and the suffering of labor with no child to show for the suffering. No pain, no gain. 
miscarriage with labor pains is all pain, no gain. Oswald, in his commentary, wrote this, quote, like a woman with false pregnancy who goes into labor but has nothing to deliver. They struggled and struggled and struggled but weren't able to deliver themselves or anyone else. So Judah suffers unbearable pain because they deserved it. They were faithless. And Isaiah wanted to express the pain of futility, the pain of suffering and the depths of it and what it means that God would use a Babylon, this foreign nation, to inflict suffering upon them. And Isaiah thought, motherhood. Israel will, will understand that. Any human can understand that. This enduring in pain with hope of salvation. If marriage, or I'm sorry, if miscarriage is a real possibility, or even a likelihood in pregnancy, especially considering the primitive uh, birthing process in the ancient Near, Near Eastern times, without the benefit of modern medicine, why would any woman even consider getting pregnant and risk the pain and the suffering of a miscarriage? I know a few people in their lives who gone through a miscarriage and they were devastated. It's painful. But why would they do it again? Go through the pain and the labor only to deliver wind? Nothing? Why do mothers do this? Knowing that this is a real possibility. Or, or we're set to give birth to a dead child. Why do moms persist? The answer is hope. Hope. That is the hope of a child. Mothers risk pain, disappointment, suffering with every pregnancy. Yet mothers continue to do it. Why? Because the reward of a child is worth the risk of pain, and disappointment, and suffering. And that future anticipation of a child this future orientation of a promise, the Bible calls that hope. We hope for what we do not see. It's still not there, but we know it's coming, so we endure. Significantly then, Isaiah calls upon the example of motherhood to vividly embody Judah's profound hope and suffering and in pain, yet, yet with hope. Motherhood for Isaiah embodies pain and suffering in a strong and a fervent hope. Not only does God teach us about hope in pain and suffering through motherhood, but God also designed motherhood to teach us about hoping with joy. It's not always about pain, but, but with joy, despite of the present painful circumstance. Jesus himself calls upon motherhood to drive home the point of lasting joy despite of, mo of momentary sorrow in the Gospel of John. So not only does motherhood embody hope and suffering, but it embodies joy as well, despite of sorrow. Here are the words of Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 21. Who, Whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow, labor pains, because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to that child, she remembers the anguish no more. All the pain is gone. Why? Because that, that a child has been born into the world. Therefore you too now know, I'm, I'm sorry, therefore you too now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one takes your joy away from you. Jesus here in the 16th chapter of John is nearing the conclusion of what he calls the farewell discourse. He's saying goodbye to his disciples. He's trying to prepare them for his death and his ascension. So he's, he takes about three or four chapters to basically tell them, bye-bye, I'm leaving you. Specifically, John here warns them, or through, or through Jesus, warns his disciples about a temporal pain 
because of the crucifixion. They will mourn because their Savior will die. Yet he, promised us, he promises them of a lasting joy because of his resurrection. For John, there was no, I'm sorry, not for John, for Jesus rather, there was no better way to teach his disciples of the necessity of temporary pain to give way to eternal joy than the example of motherhood. How can I say goodbye to my disciples knowing that I'm going to die but I'll be resurrected, that they'll be in pain but they'll have joy later, that the pain is only temporary but their joy will be eternal? How do I tell my disciples that so that they understand? Jesus says, motherhood. They'll get it. They'll get it. Labor pains, it's necessary but temporary. The birth of the child, joy, lasting, a joy that no one can take away from you. So the death of Jesus, it's necessary for salvation, but the pain is temporary. The resurrection of Jesus, it gives us eternal joy for all who believe. A joy that neither death, nor Satan, nor heights, nor principalities, nor power can ever take away from us. And if the disciples were to get this, Jesus says, think of your moms. How they gave birth to you. How their pain and their sorrow. It's painful, all right. But once the child is born, all the pain vanishes. The prophet of Jeremiah spoke of mourning and joy in a similar way in Jeremiah 31, verse 13. Then the virgin shall rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy and I will comfort them and give them joy for their sorrows. Mothers understand better than anybody else what it means to hope in the midst of momentary sorrow just for the opportunity to gain everlasting joy. I'm sure as mothers, when you look at the faces of your children, whether they're old already or look at their pictures when they're young and their moment of birth, when you look at their pictures, the momentary pain is all but gone. You don't remember that. But instead, all you remember is the joy that they give you. And so it is with our Lord. And so it is with us. We need to endure right now all manner of suffering, just like our moms did, because we are waiting for a future promise, our resurrected bodies with Jesus Christ. Finally, the motherhood embodies hope to endure suffering with perseverance and anticipation. This is the third and final point which the Apostle illustrates for us in Romans chapter 8, verses 22 and following. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Verse 24. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope because you have nothing to hope for. It's already there. There is no future forward orientation. It's present. There's nothing else to look forward to. For why does one also hope for what he sees? What is the answer? You don't. You don't. It's already there. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, that it's not yet there, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. How did the Apostle Paul want it to drive home the point of perseverance and hope and anticipation for the resurrection of our bodies? Motherhood. Labor pains. Here, specifically, the apostle is speaking of two groanings, two things that groan. First, creation groans, and second, our bodies groan. 
Sin is the singular reason for the double groaning. Creation groans because of sin. When Adam and Eve sin, their sin impacted creation itself, not just their relationship with one another. Instead of fruits and vegetations growing from the ground, we now have instead thorns and thistles because of the curse of sin. Earthquakes, typhoons, and tsunamis, and all other acts of God's calamities exist only because sin entered our world. For this reason, even our sin-infested creation desires to be redeemed to usher in the new creation of a sin-free world. More than that, our bodies, because of sin, groan in pain, yet long for our glory, the resurrection of our earthly bodies. And the older I get, the more I groan. When you wake up, ugh. I haven't been in the gym for two weeks now. I'm afraid to go back on Monday because I'm going to be groaning for another week to recover from the pain that they pushed me through. I can't walk straight. My thighs will be sore. My chest will be sore. My triceps, my abs, my whole body will be sore. When I was younger, a hard workout, wake up the next day, nothing. Your body recovers like this. Now it takes a week to recover for one workout. Our body's grown, we're getting older. Getting more wrinkles. Our dimples are now wrinkles. Having less and less hair and less and less black and more and more white hairs and skin sags the more we get older. There's one explanation for that. It's sin. Sin starts the process of decay. On the day that you eat of this, you will surely die. And once it is obeyed, the process of death began. Corruption. Decay, pain, backaches, cancer, heart attacks. So our body's grown. I can only imagine what jo Joni Erickson Tata feels. She's a famous Christian speaker who's quadriplegic. You think she groans for the resurrection? I would. can't walk, can't use your hands. She must have groan every day for the resurrection. Do you groan every day for the resurrection? To rid your body of sin and the attraction to it? To rid your body of decay and to have eternal joy with the Lord? You should. The Apostle Paul wanted us to understand this need to persevere despite of quadriplegic status of many Christians, despite of Christians dying because of their faith, despite of Christians meeting car accidents on their way to churches, despite of missionaries in medical buses falling off of cliffs in Africa because of their spending the rest of their lives preaching the gospel, in spite of your mom and dad dying in spite of going to the doctor and the doctor says cancer or diabetes or bad news why do we persevere think of your moms they persevered because they knew that there was joy in the future the joy of the child. So the pain of childbirth, momentary for the reward of eternal joy. So persevere. Push. 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 I vividly remember our firstborn, Owen. He took more than 12 hours. 
more than that. And I was getting tired. Waiting. You know, going back and forth, getting Michelle ice. You want more ice? Did you want? No. I'll just stand there, wait. And she, she's doing all the hard things. The hard part was hers. I was just standing, giving her a pep talk. You can do it, honey. Waiting and waiting and pushing and pushing and pushing. And for some reason, we came up with the idea not to have any anesthesia for her. Nothing at all. So she pushed all natural. My goodness. The, the next day, she had red dots all over her face because she pushed so hard that she popped some vessels, I think. Kept on pushing and pushing and pushing, never giving up. Was it painful? Absolutely. Believe you me. I've never seen a floor more bloody than during the labor and delivery. Oh my gosh. I was about to pass out. It's bloody. It's painful. Why would anyone go through that? Because the joy of a child, that's why. This is painful, but it's temporary. The joy of a child, it's lasting. And Jesus says, no one can take that away from you. So if mothers push and push and push, no matter what, just to give birth to their child, so Christians must also push and push to follow Jesus no matter what because the promise of a resurrected body with Jesus Christ awaits us. Motherhood in no small measure is for Isaiah, for Jesus, and for the Apostle Paul, the quintessential model for hope to endure with joy and to persevere in the midst of not the absence of pain and suffering. As we conclude, I'd like to leave you with the following address to the mothers of the church. <clears throat> mothers, we thank God for you because God made you to especially embody hope. Isaiah says it. Jesus says it. The Apostle Paul says it. If you want to know what hope looks like, Look at your moms. That's what hope looks like. To hope in pain and suffering, to hope with lasting joy despite of momentary sorrow, and to hope with perseverance and eager anticipation. Moms, without you, we would not otherwise learn the valuable lesson and witness the vivid example of hope. God made you to teach the rest of humanity what hope looks like. Motherhood does. Push. Push. Pain. Possibility of miscarriage. Some mothers even die in labor. Why would you risk death? Because there's joy that awaits. And so too with us. And moms, we thank you. We thank God for you.
chasm between you and God and so that you have to pursue God. You have to pursue a relationship with God by doing things, going to church, reading the Bible, trying to behave, trying not to lie and cheat and steal, and you're trying to pursue a relationship by doing things. But the gospel of Jesus is this. The good news is that the gospel is felt done that Jesus has brought you to himself, that there's a chasm between God and you, but God drew himself close to you through the person of Jesus to live the perfect life you, can never, you and I could never live, to die our death on the cross that you and I deserve, to be resurrected from the dead so that you and I can have victory over life, that through Jesus Christ and his resurrection power and Jesus, we can 